Hey carnivores, welcome back to the channel. It's me, Bella the Steak and Butter Gal. I wish you all a beautiful and amazing start to your December. Happy December and happy holidays. So today's guest is someone who I admire deeply. I have learned from her. I have been listening to her ever since the beginning of my carnivore journey. Sally K. Norton. I'm just so excited that I got to speak with her. Sally K. Norton is an educator, a writer, and a speaker on the topic of oxalates. She works hard to spread the message to explain expose the harmful effects and dangers of this natural chemical called oxalates. Sally will teach us everything we need to know about oxalates, including which foods they are found in, the symptoms to look out for that arise after eating these chemicals, and how to successfully heal from being poisoned from oxalates after years, sometimes decades of ingesting them. Sally Norton will be a guest speaker in the December 30 day carnivore challenge. These 30 day challenges I host every single month in hopes of helping you guys, those who want to succeed on carnivore succeed and if your goals are to lose weight or to just stick to carnivore for 30 days or just do beef only or advance your fasting game i work hard to cover all angles of health and diet we have meetings solely on weight loss on fasting on men's and women's hormones on family and kids on mental health. So once you join each month's challenge, you will have automatic access to all of the meetings. There are eight hours worth of meetings every single week during each month, and you will also have access to the playbacks to each recording in case you cannot be at the meeting live. And you will have access to these recordings forever. You will of course also have access to all guest speaker meetings where we get to spend one whole hour with the guest, learning from them and asking them our questions. So if you are interested in attending these meetings, being a part of the challenge, the sign up link as always is down below and thank you to element electrolytes for making this video possible they have extended their free sample pack promo these are not the sample packs these are the full sizes but if you guys want to test and try out element electrolytes you can feel free to type the url right here also i will link it down below in the description box so here's a closer look at the element electrolytes i have it in pretty much all of their flavors but just open up a packet put it in your glass or whatever container you drink in and add the liquid of your choice i usually just make it with cold water, mix it up, and that's it. So they have non-flavored for those who do not want stevia, but all of their products have zero sugar, no gluten, no fillers, artificial ingredients. If you guys want to try out their sample pack for free, just click on the link below or just type in the URL on the screen. So without further ado, let me invite on my special guest, Sally K. Norton. Sally, welcome. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm great. How are you? I'm great. It is such an honor to have you here because you you have no idea how many videos and podcasts I have watched you on because <laughs> I was vegan for six years before I went carnivore. So as I learned from you, I realized just how much damage I have done to my body and health. So I would love for you to teach me and my audience just how dangerous oxalates are. Yeah, it was through my health train wreck, which is really was a slow motion disaster that started when I was a teenager. And I started having pain as a 12 year old joint pain and, and neck pain. And I had trouble with uh, my back and I had trouble focusing and concentrating on my studies. Mm. It was really interesting. I decided in middle school that I wanted to study nutrition. So I knew I needed my science. When I went to Cornell for my nutrition degree, I had, I was limping around with painkillers and crutches. I had to get permission to drive on campus as much as I tried to push myself to finish the degree in the right period of time to make everybody happy. It wasn't happening. I needed foot surgery. So I left school 600 miles away to get the proper foot surgery on both of my feet. And four years later, my leave of absence is running out and I'm still on painkillers and crutches after the surgery. And nobody knew that it was my healthy diet destroying my feet. <laughs> Me neither. And I didn't find that one out until I turned just about turned 50. Cause I, when I got serious about oxalates, I was 49. It was just right now at Thanksgiving time, eight mm -hmm. years ago. So we're celebrating my eighth anniversary of low oxalate. And I'm finally recovering from a diet full of beet greens, beet, Swiss chard, sweet potatoes, walnuts, tons of vegetables, and a super uber healthy garden grown organics, two degrees in health and nutrition and public health. Wow. And I destroyed my health by following the health advice that we all are told from our professors and the whole big mainstream message. I didn't know 
that I could hurt my health on my sweet potatoes. Everyone saw my lunch at work and said, you're going to live forever. You're never going to get cancer. Everyone's impressed with how I'm eating and the way I'm eating was destroying my health. So when I finally, finally had this revelation coming from my experience, uh, I was like, floored. This is like blow the top of your skull off your head. If my arthritis and my pain and my fatigue and my sleep problems and my disabilities and inability to work and read and function Mm -hmm. is because of healthy eating. And I couldn't figure this out. How would anyone figure it out? So that's what made me really passionate. I was sort of pissed off that we're educating ourselves in, in a direction that's potentially incredibly destructive. Mind blowing. So you mentioned a list of foods just now, sweet potatoes, walnuts, beetroots. So what exactly are oxalates, especially for those who are watching right now, they have no idea what this word is and they realize, oh, it's probably in plant foods, right? Yeah, yeah, so nobody's ever heard the word oxalate. So if you haven't either, that's because you're with everyone else. It, it's We're starting to actually blow this puppy out of obscurity completely by this conversation, thanks to these kinds of discussions. We're creating a community now that's starting to know that this is a thing. I didn't make it up. Yes. <laughs> Oxalate is an important chemical. It's been important to science for hundreds of years, and it's in the medical literature for hundreds of years. It's a little tiny acid that plants make, funguses make, it forms easily in nature. It's two carbons and four oxygens, and it has these little protons, which are acid molecules that can drop off. And you can buy oxalic acid if you buy heavy duty cleaners. Mm. So you can use oxalic acid to bleach wood, wool, leather, cotton, and it's been used in industry to do those things since the 1700s. And it was extracted from a plant called oxalis. So it got the name oxalate because it comes from oxalis or Mm -hmm. sorrel, this wood sorrel, which looks like a shamrock plant. So that's where it got its name. And then we've been using it as a household cleaner since the early 1800s. And you can buy it in Barkeeper's Friend and various other cleaners because it it grabs minerals. So as that acid drops its proton molecule, it's got this charge that is attracted to minerals. So you can take the rust out of your patio. Mm. right? With oxalic acid. (laughs) You can also eat a lot of it in a spinach smoothie or almond bread or keto bread because almonds, uh, peanuts, cashews, very high in oxalate plants need the oxalate in their seeds for a number of reasons. And they can protect their ovum, their future babies with oxalic acid crystals. Cause if you build in nature, you use oxalic acid to build something called calcium oxalate crystal, which is the same thing as a kidney stone. Mm. So when acid gets in your body, it can take calcium from your blood and tissues and turn it into calcium oxalate crystals, which can set up in your bones and bone marrow and glands, especially the thyroid gland and end up as kidney stones. They can form as you're forming urine. If you have a lot of oxalic acid in your blood, then you have a lot of it in your urine and it can form calcium oxalate crystals and you get crystally urine and some people end up with kidney stones, but that's actually not the most common effect of oxalate overload. As I call it, we think plants are just this sweet little benign babies who were here because they love to be eaten. Yeah. The vegans thought that that's for sure. When I was vegan. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's really sad too, because in order to believe what we're taught that make us become vegan, you have to be lied to. I was taught to become vegetarian. What convinced me back in the early 1980s to become a vegetarian was Francis Moore LePay's famous book. It sold millions and millions of copies all over the world. It was a huge thing. So my generation, I'm on my way to being 58 years old. We already did this whole vegetarian thing. And then a few years later, I went vegan for another eight years. So I was 16 years of veggies, then vegan, eight each version. And I did it with a degree in nutrition. So I did my homemade scratch bean dishes and sweet potato dishes and tofu like crazy. I could make the best stuffed shells with tofu and the best chocolate cream pie with tofu. I was really on my way to writing a vegan cookbook. I had two file drawers of recipes, but at the time I was still afraid of salt and fat. That's what they taught me at Cornell's to be deathly afraid of salt and butter. 
Yeah. You know, so it's taken a lot of years to re-educate me. And unfortunately, I paid a, a really dire price for that. When I was vegan for six years, I realized that um, the way that I could focus, for example, in the practice room when I'm practicing piano, it really tanked. My focus got affected. I lost my period. So I'm guessing it could even affect fertility and hormones. And most of all, my skin suffered. I had so much acne, uh, so much dry skin and eczema that started breaking out. So what are some of the symptoms or just effects of eating oxalates? The most common symptom is you don't notice any symptoms. Yeah. And, and it's because we're just not even in tune with the fact that when we're eating healthy, it could be connected to not falling asleep easily. For example, there's a lot of uh, neurological effects, like your inability to focus brain inflammation and neurological difficulties are one of them. So nerves are the things that help your muscles turn on and off diarrhea or constipation. These, these might be neurological in nature, or they can be muscle dysfunction, but they both come from electrolyte disturbances. Mm -hmm. So with oxalate, because it's chelating minerals in your blood, it's disturbing your electrolyte balance. So it messes up how well your nerves work and your muscles work. So you think you can think of your blood as this lovely patio and along comes this cleaner who's going to clean it right up beautifully. <laughs> like, oh no, really one of the big categories of symptoms is digestion problems. This is a vicious cycle because once you get leaky gut and have gut inflammation, your, the amount of oxalate that moves from your food into your bloodstream goes way up because with inflamed gut, you have more gaps between the cells, these little tiny connections between this single layer of cells that line our digestive tract are called tight junctions. And the tight junctions work a little bit like Velcro. You know how Velcro has two sides that hook? Yes. Well, these tight junctions are kind of like Velcro, but the Velcro kind of pulls apart. And so there's a lot more space between the Velcro hooks in the gut yeah. where the water just floats from the food into the blood. Well, oxalate is this little acid, one little two carbon molecule it just floats in the water. Okay. So that's called paracellular transit. It's going between the cells. And so you get a much higher rate of it flowing into the blood when you've got inflammation in the gut, leaky gut and so on. So there's this vicious cycle where oxalate, oxalic acid and the crystals that the plants make to store the calcium and, and to protect themselves, plants deliberately build crystals, they lay out this matrix of amino acids to deliberately construct specific shapes of calcium oxalate crystals as part of their self-defense program. So they're full of these little bits that are like shredded glass, mm. fine, fine glass, you know, like finer than say insulation glass, you know, how you have fiberglass for insulation. It's so fine. You can't yes. see it or touch it very well or feel it, but you're eating basically sandpaper and the sandpaper doesn't usually get through the leaky Velcro gaps in your gut, but it's also abrasive. So you're like eating sandpaper that's abrasive. It also has electromagnetic charges. And the most toxic form of oxalate is the nanocrystal. Okay. So nanocrystals are so small. They're like the size of a single molecule. You know, they're, you can't see them anywhere. It's hard to measure them. It's hard to know they're there. They've been kind of ignored, mm -hmm. but it's a stage. The oxalic acid goes from an ion stage, that's a single molecule with a negative charge or a double negative charge. It can have both mm -hmm. either, or then it grabs a mineral at some point, magnesium, iron, or calcium, calcium being its favorite calcium loves oxalic acid. The two of them get together and they're like, darling, I've been looking for you my whole life. And they're, <laughs> they're into it. Yeah. So then you get this molecule called calcium oxalate. Then you get a few pairs lining up and they start forming a seed crystal. And that's the beginning of your nano crystal. This is all uber invisible. And the effects are having, you know, on how well your cells are working and, and cell and tissues are starting to communicate. There's all kinds of effects for the vascular system, your liver, your critical organs, that the body has sort of reserves and kind of covers all that up. Mm -hmm. So the initial years of damage, sometimes there's very few symptoms, but it, with the neurological symptoms, you might see mood changes. You might see irritability, anger, mm -hmm. uh, depression, anxiety, worry, lack of motivation, loss of excitement in life. All of these things are signs of brain inflammation. Just had a new client this week mm -hmm. and he's a, a classic example where the brain effects are really uh, 
the worst for him. He had a history. He's like 61 and he went on a juicing thing a couple of years ago. And after 18 months, it was just killing him. And he, so he went on a carnivore like diet with a few salads and things like that. And, and mostly meats. Mm -hmm. And within two months, he, he started having crystals popping out of his body. He had extreme pain, tinnitus, and he descended into such an evil depression. He can't hardly function. He's on two drugs now for depression. Wow. And this is all neurotoxicity from basically being poisoned by a cleaning chemical. So there's the gut stuff. There's the nerve stuff with mood and thinking and energy and sleep. And then there's rheumatological issues where you get arthritic pain, joint pain, tennis elbow, you get connective tissue breakdown where your skin is starting to have problems or you're having trouble healing things. Or like me, my feet stayed lame and sort of crappy until I turned 50 when I was on this diet. Like I spent wow. 30 years of never being able to run dance, wear heels or go barefoot in my own house. I needed support of my Sebago moccasin shoes that had this straight sides and nice toe box to kind of hold my feet together because the connective tissue was never quite there. And that little spreading and the feet gave them achiness very quickly, like 10 minutes of trying to stand at the sink for, would hurt my feet for decades until I stopped eating sweet potatoes and Swiss chard, not eating sweet potatoes fixed 30 years of foot disability. Mm -hmm. It fixed a sleep disorder. I had to quit my career writing research grants and working at the university. I was so tired and my back hurt so much. Mm -hmm. I was kneeling on the floor, working 50 hours a week, writing research grants and bleeding to death with fibroids that the doctor said, well, they're not big enough to explain that. And I needed a hysterectomy. They did a full frontal cut and found loose blood and endometriosis all over my colon. And he's like, your ovaries are a mess. So I was on epidural. So we had a conversation in the middle of this. Yes. I'm like, oh, really? Maybe for the last four years, because I noticed for the last four years, I had become so allergic to plastic. Like if I drank water out of a plastic bottle, I would bleed vaginally and get headaches. Oh. You know, your liver gets kind of screwed up from being constantly flushed in a poison. Within the first 10 minutes of eating it, it starts getting absorbed in the stomach. Oh. And But you know, food takes 24 hours to go from the lips to the toilet. So during that 24 hours, there's 24 hours of opportunity for oxalic acid to work its way into the bloodstream. So you have a pretty long period of oxalate flushing into the liver, but there's a peak around between three and six hours after a meal where the highest levels of oxalate are in the blood now. And also in the urine, because the kidneys, once the oxalic acid gets to the kidneys, the kidneys do their best to get rid of as much as they can, but they can't get all of it partially because it's already gone to the liver. Yeah. It takes a lot of glutathione antioxidant, internal antioxidant powers, which the liver is loaded with and really good at protecting itself. But what you're doing though, is reducing your ability to deal with other chemicals because mm -hmm. you're using up so much of that antioxidant power that the liver has. So when you don't have a liver that can deal with the toxic world we're in, you're going to get more neurotoxic and you're going to have more brain fog and more inability to focus and sleep because you're going to have more nerve damage. For most people are eating many times a day. The people are eating a lot of sweet potatoes yep. are not getting by on one meal. So that peak, that four hour peak hits, and then you eat another meal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that four hour peak hits, then you eat another meal. Yeah. And then the next four hours is when you try to go to sleep and you can't, it's all invisible to us. We don't realize that if we're restless or angry or have a bad mood or have no motivation and can't sleep and are tired and chronic fatigue or have a backache or mm. tennis elbow or carpal tunnel or, you know, TMJ or tooth sensitivity that it could be a sign of some degree of oxalate poisoning. So I'm sure a lot of the viewers right now are terrified and they're wondering, well, how do I get rid of my body from all of these oxalates? I've been ex-vegan or ex-vegetarian for X amount of years. Do we have to completely stop eating the foods or can we go another route where the detox symptoms may be a little bit less harsh? Yeah, so what you're describing is the fact that this oxalate does get caught up in the body and accumulate. So even though the the kidneys after all these meals are working hard, working hard, trying to get rid of it. A certain amount after every meal is ending up in various tissues in the body and where it is in your body is a unique 
scenario. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of differentiation, lots of individuality. Nobody looks the same, but if you want to stop eating oxalates, this is a profound thing to do. But if you're eating a lot of green juices or nuts or sweet potatoes or buckwheat is another one, chocolate is another one. You could, you know, like string these together and you've got a pretty good avalanche. Yes. And you could be I mean, the, the research suggests that you're equipped to handle about 150 milligrams of oxalate a day. Okay. Like that would be a fine amount to eat and that shouldn't poison you and it should be fine. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that 150 is like 28 almonds or something and 50 would be like a pint of tea, you know? So it's real. If you start adding on a pint of tea, some potatoes here and there, some chocolate, some almonds, and then a spinach smoothie, <laughs> you're like, you could be at 2000 or more pretty easily, mm -hmm. especially if you're doing a green juicing thing on using almond butter and almond milk and almond this and that, you could be over 2000. Your body's been working hard to prevent you from ruining your vascular system with that and ruining your kidneys. Mm -hmm. So I think the body is more of a sequestration mode, which means holding onto it. Mm -hmm. So it's going to hold onto it in various tissues in order to protect your vital organs. If you turn that ship around, it's been holding on. It's been waiting for the moment when it can let it go. The stuff you just ate last week is not settled way down into the bones and some deep space where the immune system has encapsulated it and tried to make it less toxic because the immune system is stashing it away and wrapping it up in various immune tissues. There's a couple of ways the body does this, but it's like taking a live wire that's electrocution wire and wrapping it in vinyl so that the, the other cells can be nearby and this and it remains sort of dormant. Yes. It's yes. Kind of, you can think of it as like barrels of toxic oil buried under an old gas station, mm. sort of dormant, mm -hmm. <laughs> but leaking out a little bit of problems that are sort of simmering below the surface. A couple of years is all you need to poison yourself and maybe even less. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, a loss of reserves. It's causing a loss of minerals. You're low in calcium, you're low in potassium, you're low in magnesium, you're low in minerals. You've been wearing them out. You've probably had a fair amount of acidic metabolism from this mm -hmm. and the bones have had to buffer that. So your bones have been sacrificing minerals too. So you're losing your reserves to cope with more oxalate. You're losing your reserves to cope generally. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you go from no symptoms to suddenly all of a sudden it shows up because nice. it you've kind of reached a brittle point. So when you change from eating really high oxalate diet and try to go down to a low oxalate diet, a lot of people have done this when they switch to carnivore because people yes. go from paleo to keto to back to juicing, back to keto, and then to carnivore, you know, so they're that's experimenting. Right. <laughs> and even vegans will jump from vegan to carnivore. And that's a zero oxalate diet. Yep. Plant meats and milk and cheese and, and eggs and butter don't have any oxalate. Wow. So if you go from thousands to zero, this is like taking your body at highway speed and hitting a brick wall. It's a very abrupt 50 to zero. Some people like this man I was mentioning earlier, within two months of going carnivore, he was sicker than ever. And that's because he went so low, the body started releasing the oxalate that had been accumulating in his body, increasing the load of oxalate in his bloodstream and so on higher than it was when he was eating the high oxalate foods. There's so much on board that it really from internally releasing from cells and tissues is fairly toxic process. And that's when the symptoms really can come on hard and fast. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if you, if you don't do well in carnivore after six months and it's still not making you amazing, it could be because you're sort of auto intoxifying from this internal load of oxalates in your body. Mm -hmm. And we do have ways to, to try to mitigate that. You have to add in a little smidgen, but the right amount of something like a spinach, oh. clementine, you know, uh, some tea, tea is uh, works for a lot of people. Like one good, strong cup of black tea can cut down these symptoms because it turns, it tells the body, no, no, not time to clear. It's not winter anymore. Mm. So we can, we can put people back on, sometimes they're going to need carbohydrates because oxalate interrupts enzymes in the body and causes energy deficiencies and can cause low blood sugar problems. in some people, they're not able to generate enough glycogen and restore their muscles and so on. So, you know, oxalate might be one reason why different people who are promoting carnivore are arguing with each other. Yes. <laughs> some people really have 
metabolic damage. And it might be because of the oxalate where they literally do need some carbs, maybe not every day, you know, and depending on their age and their athleticism and so on, their demand for energy and their activities is different. But most of us who've hurt ourselves with oxalate, there's not a demand for energy. We're just scraping ourselves out of bed every day. We're barely able to exercise without fatigue and pain and so on. We're really sick. What we're being told that spinach is so great, there's actually not science there. The science says the spinach hardly has any, you know, it's losing the folate and the supposed good stuff that's in it. There's no useful calcium in, in spinach. It's mostly bound up with oxalate. And yet people say for calcium, eat your leafy greens but spinach, Swiss chard, and beet greens have no calcium whatsoever in terms of your body's being able to access it. Instead, it has a poison called calcium oxalate, but we're claiming that that's calcium. So you're being manipulated within imperfect and for no good reason. We've known this for a hundred years. This is not new information. I am not making up new information. I'm just reporting what everyone is ignoring. Do you recommend, let's say someone who is watching, they are considering carnivore and they just watch this video and they're like, but I'm eating so many foods high in oxalates. Do I slowly wean off of that while increasing foods that are high in calcium, animal foods? What would be the best way to go for that person? You know, we all have a different constitution and how well we can manage the details. And I try to keep it as reasonable as possible. I mean, eating is an organic process and you can't turn it into a math project, right? So yeah. <laughs> uh, it's really, it's an, you take an assessment and you can find um, a symptom inventory on my website and you can find a beginner's guide that lists the worst offenders and the low oxalate foods okay. and take an assessment about which really high oxalate foods you've been overdoing, especially recently mm -hmm. and pick one or two of those and start finding a replacement for them on the low oxalate side. And it doesn't have to be green for green or starch for starch. You can be converting more towards a, a protein based, uh, an animal fat based diet. That's fine to do. Mm -hmm. Um, but don't eliminate all the worst offenders immediately. So this is a kind of a relaxed thing. You know, you don't have to change out your spices right away. You don't have to worry about every detail. You can keep your cup of tea, just shrink the chocolate bar down to a reasonable portion okay. and quit the concentrated spinach and the concentrated almond flour. Even if you just start with almonds, my wish for the world is that humans would quit eating almonds. Yeah. If you start there. That is a road to better life right there. Almond flour included, right? Yeah. Everything almond, almond milk, almond, this almond, that almond flour, almond flour, almond muffins, almond pancakes, almond, this <laughs> almond, that almond Christmas treats, almond cookies, <laughs> yes. almond ice cream. Like you can't even buy an ice cream flavor right, hardly right. that doesn't have chocolate and or nuts in it. Yeah. Like, everywhere you go to the donut shop, probably half the donuts are dipped in chop in some kind of almond, this or chocolate that yeah. like, it's really amazing how ubiquitous almonds are and how much industry and marketing and like we've managed to figure out how to make almonds cheap holidays are coming up and at least in chinese cuisine we really up the seasonings the spices the herbs um are there oxalates in that too and should we be worried about even if we're eating low carb carnivore i have had clients who really didn't get the real improvement until they gave up the spicy food Mm. So the ones that are high in oxalate i don't you know i had there's a whole study of chinese herbs medicinal and otherwise that was um, reported. I can share that with you. Maybe we can talk about it in a future discussion. Sure. I can pull it up and we can look at it. But okay. um, generally the spices that are really high are turmeric or really Indian spices, cumin, turmeric, black pepper is pretty high. It's real easy to switch wow. over to white pepper. So okay. white pepper eliminates that if you are in a math and you want a mathematically amount of oxalate, get rid of things like pepper. You can sometimes use extracts. Like there's a black pepper essential oil. If you dilute cool. essential oils, there's a few herbs or excuse me, spices where essential oils kind of work. And cumin is one of those, but it needs to be very diluted because cumin is something that will take over your dish and you won't taste anything else, right? Mm -hmm. Sage and marjoram and thyme are all low in oxalate, Ooh, okay. but I don't touch any of them because I seem to be allergic to them. Yeah. And that's what happens with oxalate poisoning. You tend to become super sensitive and allergic to things. So like there's certain fish I can't eat. I can't seem to eat anything with a feather on it anymore. Plants. And that's really how I got to carnivore for myself, where I'm oh. principally building my diet with meat, huge piles of locally raised meats, and uh, that's because with low oxalate, I was able to hear more clearly from my body what was and wasn't agreeing with me. And mm -hmm. it kept narrowing me towards, well, 
beef and pork. <laughs> my clients and others would say, Hey, I quit oxalate and now I have crystals coming out of my head, yeah. my forehead, my arms. I have corpuscles. I have my eczema came back and look what's yes. coming out of here. I have one woman, she said she snowed white dust for two years. Oh. I mean, so some people can really get rid of it through the skin, which is a beautiful thing because now you're not asking the kidneys to do everything. Mm -hmm. And some people can poop it out. They'll start getting gritty stools and they'll get like burning rectum and hemorrhoids and funky things going on with their elimination yes. because the colon can help release oxalate too. When the oh. calcium oxalate crystals are forming in your urine, it creates this little invisible crystals. And when there's a lot of them, it's called crystal urea, which means crystal in urine. And so when you see it in the toilet bowl, it's not crystal clear, like, you know, uh, water, normal <laughs> yes. urine should look like this only slightly yellow. Yeah. No, it looks murky and you can't really see the bottom of the toilet. And that's because all those crystals are floating in the, in the fluid there and reflecting light. So I have been miss cloudy urine. Wow. A one in the world <laughs> for decades. Oh my gosh. You know, in the year eight, I have it a lot less, but even this last week I had some headachiness, some clumsiness, which is another one of these neurological signs that your eye hand coordination is not right. And you're dropping stuff. I dropped my little jar of, cal of potassium citrate twice this week mm -hmm. and the powder landed underneath the refrigerator. I'm like, this does not happen. This is something's up and I have this headache and I'm not sleeping as well. Me and my oxalates again, we're still working on the oxalates in my back, I think right now. So I'm guessing you are really working actively every day to heal, recover. And I would just love to know a typical day of eating for you. Um, and also what practices do you do every day to recover? My diet is usually two meals a day. Okay. Um, we have a meal somewhere between 11 and 12, you know, late morning brunch, which mm -hmm. is usually some big slab of 10 to 12 ounces of meat, often beef. Mm -hmm. Usually I believe in putting two or more kinds of meat on the plate or foods on the plate in order to keep your appetite up so that you eat enough food and it's interesting and you're not bored. Mm -hmm. I also use different plates. I keep my plates nice and I have like three different kinds of plates. So it keeps it interesting and different. Yeah, so cool. it's not boring and I uh, make sure that it's cooked properly and presented properly. So it's done with respect. Sometimes use seasonings like mustard and horseradish and sometimes don't, you know, like keep it varied, uh -huh. but basically I eat a big slab of meat and <laughs> varied that looks cute. Yeah. And then I do the same thing later in the day for an evening meal. For women, fat is so key. Yes. Like I never feel great until I've eaten a pound of lard, you know, like, <laughs> the more, <laughs> the more fat I eat, the happier I am. And I think yes. that's, that's a women thing, especially with estrogen and it just the whole female physiology is especially dependent on fat. And there's plenty of history that suggests that humans focused on fat in their hunting and they didn't even like lean animals. They would give that to the dogs. We always have some form of sparkling water. This is yep, Mountain yep. Valley spring water, but we also keep like flavored seltzers in the house and we use bitters in here and ginger juice and different ways to vary this too and keep the cocktail hour fun. <laughs> um, I like a sort of low carb morning mm. and a high fat diet. Um, and I just like to feel good. I tell people, look, I'm the servant of my body. What my body says it likes we agree with because <laughs> my body <laughs> pays me back with a good night's sleep, productivity, happiness, and, you know, peace of mind. It, it works great. It's a good deal. I've cut. Do you do anything like sauna, red light therapy at all? Oh yeah. Cold shower every morning. I haven't had a hot shower except occasion when I wash my hair because Raynaud syndrome is very popular with those of us with oxalate poisoning. And I have that. This kind of hair has to drip dry. <laughs> so you get evaporative cooling and it's way too cooling for a yinny, skinny old dame who's got oxalate problems. So I, I use a three minute as cold as we can get shower for three years now, I've I sometimes do ice baths in the summer. This year I did maybe 14 ice baths. It takes about 40 pounds of ice from the store, which is only a three minute errand. Mineral baths are really big, like minerals that have sea salt, Epsom salts, some baking soda, a little dash of borax actually, and soaking in the tub for 20, hot tub for 20 minutes. I like to think I do that every week or every few days. I kind of do it when I feel like it. 
um, or when I don't feel good is a good time to do it. Or when you're wondering if you're going to have a good night's sleep, that's a good time to do it. But that's a sort of surface way to get more minerals and mineral depletion is a big issue. Uh, and so is acidity. So another thing you have to do to take care of yourself is address your acidity, which lemon juice can help with citrate supplements and mineral supplements all help address acidity. On average, three to four hot yoga classes a week. And I go to the gym at least once or twice a week and do additional sauna. Basically the sauna is really good anti-inflammatory. The cold treatment is very Mm anti-inflammatory and then keeping the acidity down. And then meditation is key. Like anything you can do to keep your kind of vagal nerve, parasympathetic, sympathetic balance is really important because your system is stressed out and using energy to take care of you. And so we, we meditate in a group on uh, usually on Sundays and belong to another meditation group that does a breathing approach. And you can't always keep everything perfect, but if you can remember, like you deserve a little bouquet of flowers now and then, and you should play some nice music and you should find a way to relax. You should call someone you like, don't waste time on people who make you crazy, get a meter and check your electromagnetic pollution in your house. that's really interesting to do because I found just the lamp cord behind my bed Uh was causing my bed area to have too much electromagnetic pollution. So all I had to do is change the lamp cord to the other wall because the lamp's basically in the corner and that fixed that just plug it in over there done. And my computer area was the other area with the screens and everything that was the most radioactive. And all we had to do is rearrange the cords Uh and the way things were plugged in and that cut it down to like 10% of what it was. Final question, where can people find more of you, connect with you and work with you? Well, I have a website, sallyknorton.com and there are a lot of tabs in there. So read through the tabs and check out the shop page if you want a cookbook, the beginner's guide, some freebies you can get there. You can also reach out to us and email us through the website. I do spend a fair amount of time on Instagram. So you can find me there and uh, connect with me there as well. Those would be the smartest two places if you want a quick response. Thank you so much, Sally Norton, for joining me today. I'll see you next time. Excellent. See you again. Bye. Sally Norton will be a guest speaker in the December 30-Day Carnivore Challenge. These 30-Day Challenges I host every single month in hopes of helping you guys, those who want to succeed on carnivore, succeed. And if your goals are to lose weight or to just stick to carnivore for 30 days or just do beef only or advance your fasting game, I work hard to cover all angles of health and diet. We have meetings solely on weight loss, on fasting, on men's and women's hormones, on family and kids, on mental health. So once you join each month's challenge, you will have automatic access to all of the meetings. There are eight hours worth of meetings every single week during each month. And you will also have access to the playbacks to each recording in case you cannot be at the meeting live. And you will have access to these recordings forever. You will of course also have access to all guest speaker meetings where we get to spend one whole hour with the guest, learning from them and asking them our questions. So if you are interested in attending these meetings, being a part of the challenge, the Senate link as always is down below.